This is exactly right. And welcome. This is My Favorite Murder. It's a true crime comedy podcast that we do for you uh, bi-weekly. Um, weekly. He- it's weekly. Oh. Well, then the other one. Right. It's twice a week. Yeah. So twice a week, but this is the long form version. This is the real one. The other one's fake. It's fake. It's more of a holdover. Yeah. But this is the real deal. Right. And that's Karen Kilgara. And that's Georgia Hardstark. And that's who we are. Um, Stephen, uh, Ray Morris is holding down the ones and twos. <laughs> Stephen's there. Elvis is on my lap. All is right with the world. That's right. Uh, you have your nice mug of tea. I'm literally drinking some, <laughs> what Georgia described as lemon balm tea. <laughs> so I hope there's a little bit of melted lip balm in there. I hope that's what you gave me as a gift. My gift to you. Mwah. Oh, can I tell you? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, all these dumb tea bags with their dumb tea things and their dumb quotes and shit yeah this one just says be curious fuck you we're curious Look, about what the fuck lemon bomb tea is also i'm going to yeah don't, you know don't fucking tell me because if they think that you're just like this boring person living your life and then you need tea to come tell you how to live your fucking life listen lemon balm you don't know me you yeah. don't know my family <laughs> stay out of it you don't know my level of curiosity i'm up your ass i've already googled you right Lemon balm what tea. What if your name is Jonathan Van Ness and you have a podcast about being curious <laughs> already? Right. And Jonathan Van Ness is like, I need to do more for you, T. Yeah. He's like, oh, I guess I should cancel my podcast <laughs> because I'm not curious enough according to T. <laughs> Sorry, lemon balm. Oh, Jesus, T. What mm-hmm. more do you want from our lives? Get out of our face. Hey, speaking of uh, fall <laughs> things and all the fall li- living your life, T things, yeah. we'd like to give a shout out to Circleville, Ohio. <gasps> And their Circleville Pumpkin Show, uh, which is really a festival, so I don't know why they call it a show. I mean, I feel like that's part of the uh, part of the charm mm. of the Circleville Pumpkin Show is that they think they're a show, <laughs> and it you can go. It's um, October seventeenth to the twentieth in <laughs> so Circleville. Ohio. We're not going, but you should fucking. To- we would go. I would. Lo- a lot of people have tweeted and said, "Are you guys going to make a surprise?" I wish. <laughs> And I truly would do, I would love nothing more, but we have to go up to the Pacific Northwest That's this right. weekend. So we can't. That'll be great. That'll be balmy and, and lemony too. Yeah. There's going to be tons of lemon balm tea up there. Yes. But uh, please, if you're anywhere near Circleville, Ohio, which, which means near Columbus, Col- it's Columbus. Yeah. That's where it, it came out of our live Columbus show from mm-hmm. last year. The Circleville pumpkin murders no yes. the circle bill letter the letter murders, writer the mysterious I letter writer then did for drunk history oh right too yeah that, that i forgot while you were telling the story <laughs> <laughs> that's you how drunk re- i was you had a recovered drunk memory which if is you, the best everyone to know if the show is real if people really get drunk <laughs> on it just know i couldn't remember that i had done that i had, didn't remember the story until you were like this is Hold on a second. I'm having this horrible seems familiar. memories of this. Um, and just in, in case you are in, if you're a pageant person, uh-uh. um, you can run for Circleville Miss Pumpkin, right, Stephen? Uh-huh. Is it Miss Pumpkin? Yeah, I believe it's Miss Pumpkin, and then there's Little Miss Pumpkin. Mm, right. I'm going to run for Little Miss Pumpkin. There's two ways to be beautiful at the Circleville <laughs> Pumpkin Show. Get over there. See what you, how you rate. Wear a murderino so you can identify other murderino people. You guys can all gather, eat. I hope there's fried pumpkin there, because that's absolutely my favorite food in the world. Anything fried with, pumpkin? Anything with pumpkin in it I want to eat. And I don't mean pumpkin spice. Fuck pumpkin spice. Okay. I want the te- When I get tempura and that fucking piece of pumpkin is in there fried... Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going out of my mind. I see that it is very delicious. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. I agree. What, Stephen? Say it. Oh, there's a pet parade. Oh, <laughs> my God. Ste- <laughs> On Friday. Next level. <laughs> Holy shit. It's pets will be there in their costumes. <gasps> there's no reason not to go to Why the Circleville Pumpkin Show. Why would Elvis, I'm dressing you up in solidarity. And sending you out in a <laughs> FedEx box. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. You're going to appear as a FedEx box. <laughs> 
at the Circleville Pumpkin Show what if this Elvis weekend. Burst like a like a cake burst out of a that Xbox. <laughs> like a stripper. <laughs> like the stripper he is. We have more uh news to announce. Yeah, m- more th- that's their project. Yeah. We have our own project. What do you want to go first? Or you want me to go first. Um well I guess that's pretty big news. A couple people have tweeted and asked us this when we announced the book. Um, right. We wrote a book called Stay Sexy and Don't Get Murdered. It's go it's being written as a or like it was a dual memoir, a dual memoir. Calling it, which I think is might be the first of its kind. That's right. And um, we're just here to announce now we get to announce we we will be reading our own audio book. Of course we will be. I mean, who the fuck else is going to do it? <laughs> we were we suggested Paul Giamatti, <laughs> but he's very busy yeah, on billions, apparently. Um, so uh, go to Audible or anywhere you, that you listen to your audiobooks. And, and you can pre-order it. Pre-order that shit and then get ready for us to read you a book. You're going to get so sick of our voices. Uh, it's going to be really embarrassing, like, reading some of that shit out loud. I'm going to love every moment of it. I'm going to cherish <laughs> my own instrument and listen to myself for the first time ever. We should have an alternative Paul Giamatti version just in case people don't want to listen to us. If anyone is Paul Giamatti's yes. agent or representative, cousin uh, cousin would be great. Like right. you could get him at uh, Thanksgiving. Linda Giamatti? Linda? Nay. <laughs> nay. What's her new last name? Um, McGillicuddy? <laughs> <laughs> Linda, we would love it if you would hook us up yeah. and have Paul. I think he would actually nail it. Get him nice and drunk on vodka and lemon balm tea. Okay. Apparently that's a new thing. That's <laughs> Did a new you cocktail. just make that up? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's just vodka with lemon balm tea. Vodka and hot tea. <laughs> Put some bitters in there. That's actually be nice for your throat. It might throat be kind coat. of bitter as it is. That's true. And, and get Paul Giamatti to sign the papers. We'll Please. send them to you, Linda. God, this is... Linda, thanks so much for doing this, <laughs> this job with us. Yeah. We really appreciate all the work you do. That's right. You'll get a special thank you in the notes. Linda McKillicuddy Giamatti, you are our <laughs> new manager. Um, <laughs> Meredith, you're fired. Sorry. <laughs> uh, oh, I also... Also... Oh, hey, th- don't fast forward yet. This is really exciting. Today, which is Thursday, which is tomorrow for us, our new line of fucking merch is coming out. Fall merch. Fall merch that also includes the much fucking anticipated <laughs> pet merch. Uh, Finally, we can talk about it. Yeah. So a bunch of new shit's coming out um, t- t- Thursday, today. Myfavoritemurder.com and then go to the store. There's a bunch of new quotes. Like, uh, you've seen some of them at the live shows. Uh, what in the fucking fuck? Mm-hmm, a classic. <laughs> Spell it like you say it. Great. Fucking hooray. Uh, and the then... F- fucking hooray is in really cool kind of disco lettering that all, I love. Yeah, it's all really cool font that we specifically made people change 14 times until we were satisfied <laughs> with it. Because that's how we are. Little closer, little yeah. closer. Um, and then, very excited to announce our two new special... Uh, they're called Classic Eco Jersey Jogger Pants. The fuck is sweatpants, people? Sweatpants, baby. And one of them says... Fuck you, I'm married. <laughs> and I could not be more excited to get these for myself. Hey, are you a newlywed or an oldlywed? Is your friend about to get married and she needs something to wear on her wedding day, getting dressed up in the photos? Or do you or do you have a an sibling that's wedding. just some has been married for 30 years and is totally over it? Well, it sounds like you need to get these sweatpants. So there's two sweat there's sweatpants and then our fucking pet line, which is so exciting. We Karen had has a Oh my god, you guys have to see this. <laughs> so it's uh it's the dog Karen's dogs. I'm coming out with a first a fiercely private right. t shirt of Frank and George that Chris Fairbanks drew, who I do my, the other podcast Do You Need a Ride with, mm-hmm. and he's an amazing graphic designer and illustrator. So he drew a picture of George drinking water out of the glass, like the video that I posted about six months ago on Twitter, and then a picture of Frank, <laughs> who's basically I think he's smoking a cigar? a cigar. It looks like a cigar. Cigar. He's smoking and a cigar. And it says in beautiful font. For, it's like such a cool punk rock shirt. <laughs> I love it. But Thank then, you. hey, if you're not a dog person and you're a cat person, our friend Michael Ramstead, who created the really beautiful chalk outline, like cartoony drawings of us that we use all the time and the love. The earliest, I think, drawing of us. Yeah, that yeah. he did for us. And we we're like, can we buy that from you? We love it. Uh, he's so talented. He ha- d- did an Elvis design for us. It's Elvis Want a Cookie and it's fucking cool as it's shit. It's so cute. It's got Elvis on it. I love it. And then we also have have those that are available for pets for like dogs t-shirts yeah. your dog can wear a shirt of my dog and then if your dog is an asshole or hates everyone <laughs> there's one that says here's the thing fuck everyone that's a dog shirt yes i don't need to tell you there's more there's even more it's really good stuff for the pet line yeah go to collars my, bowls exactly you know it. my favorite murder 
dot com. Go to the store. It'll we're be very, up there. We're very excited to be bringing you yeah. um, merch. And there's um, more to come. So merch that appeals to you. And we're very excited to be getting so much beautiful art and things that you guys create and make about this show. Um, one of which um, a person named Callie Lawson, who is Callie Lawson Art on Instagram, drew a picture of Cody the Chainsaw Chicken, <laughs> which was a story that we just did d- like... This week on the mini came out, oh, yeah, yeah, Monday. It came out Monday. And I think she immediately drew this picture and it is hauntingly beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's a, a child on a BMX bike with a chainsaw slung just over his shoulder. Just how you described him that you wanted him to be he's looking up at a fucking utility pole. In the in, most you don't even see his face and the way he's looking at it with like reverence and awe <laughs> he's about to do some shit and his like little ears are sticking out because he's a kid oh it's beautiful thank you kelly lawson so much it's a, it's a wonderful it's a wonderful picture yeah and thank you once again to nick terry uh-huh. who has made yet another hilarious <laughs> video of the wheat woo conversation we had about georgia not being able to whistle <laughs> And what's his um, Instagram? He started a new Instagram of just the Insta- uh, MFM animations. So yeah. you can find oh, them all wow. in one place. Yeah, That's cool. A- MFM underscore um, animated. Okay. Wow. On Instagram. That's it's rad. so great. Thank you, Nick Terry. And he'll be at our Seattle show, so we should give him a shout out there. Oh, very cool. Okay, f- finally, we'll stop talking. Speaking about live shows. We're not going to fucking ever stop talking. <laughs> oh, I forgot that that's our, our whole podcast is. <laughs> that's all this is. Um, Halloween show. It's <laughs> on Halloween. You've heard of it. It's at the Microsoft Theater. It's going to be literally fucking huge. 7,000 fucking people. What's up, Los Angeles? I'm terrified. <laughs> uh we're Karen and I are dressing up as in, as a surprise costume, and we want everyone's been asking, should we dress up? Yes, we Please. highly recommend dressing up in costume. Every person I run into is like, I'm going. I immediately ask what you're going to dress up as. It's going to be great. So yes, dress up, Stephen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Stephen has an announcement. I love that you did this. I just wanted to just so people, you know, it's our costumes could be very colorful, and I just didn't want anyone to get kicked out. You know, good. Just yeah, in lose case. part of the, an essential part of their costume. Yeah. So if yeah, hatchets probably right. don't. Bring, Any, any weaponry of any kind right. do not bring it with you even though you're michael myers and you're yes. like but it's my thing don't bring a knife yeah so, so yeah yeah it's it's all that common sense stuff and then i guess if you want to bring like a poster or a banner or a red flag uh it has to be smaller than 11 by 17 <laughs> and not on a pole that seemed like the most oh, important thing okay to know, but not on a pole so like not on a stick or anything yeah, yeah. It's or like you don't can, bring a stick to or it. don't let it strip for a living oh either Aww. way I mean, if you can make a living stripping, go what? for it. Ain't no thing, baby. No. Yeah. That's a Missy Elliott quote. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. Shoes for safety. Please wear shoes. Okay. <laughs> that's basically it. You can't go as the barefoot Contessa. <laughs> oh my God. Is someone going to do it now? <laughs> the, the, maybe a zombie barefoot Contessa. I love it. Okay. Okay. This is an email that got sent um and this is off of our last the last live show we posted was from durham Mm -hmm. and i did the lawson family murders Mm -hmm. and uh that was the story um well i'll just read this to you hi hilarious people in your menageries i loved seeing you in charlotte um i gave you the treasure chest with a mini elvis for georgia Mm -hmm. and two dollar coins for karen i have that mini elvis it was at the bottom of the bag Mm. when i unpacked you stole (laughs) it it was just in the bag i'll give it back damn it so, listening to your live du- Durham episode, though, I was horrified slash delighted mm. to hear Karen tell the story of the Lawson family murders. I'm an English teacher, and while I t- currently teach college English, my very first teaching position was at North Stokes High School, a stone's throw from the old Lawson family property. Uh-uh. Ooh. I knew nothing about it, but on Halloween that first year, when I let the kids tell scary stories, instead of, you know, teaching them things, oh. um, the kids collectively told me the entire Ooh. Lawson family murder story. I uh. love that this class full of kids was like, yeah, no. And my mom says that oh, I love it. Did um, she say high school? Because I'm <laughs> imagining children in her. She uh first high school, yes. Oh, great. Well, I'm like, Mrs. I my mom told me It's because she said the kids right. collectively. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um <laughs> it's much cuter if it's first graders. <laughs> okay, so I didn't believe it at first, but I did notice that I had quite a few students with the last name of Lawson. <gasps> and come to find out that many of them were descendants of the Lawson family. They all knew the gory details because they'd all grown up hearing their parents talk about it one student get ready has a great aunt who all caps still owns her stolen cake raisin no yep 
preserved in a small glass box. Holy so shit. I tell the story. There was a cake that was on the, t- on the table when these murders happened. It was a Christmas cake and it had raisins sprinkled on the top. Gross. Georgia was very upset about raisins on a cake. Yes. We talked about it forever. <laughs> Someone ended up buying that cake and keeping it for a while. Apparently, this person's great aunt stole the cake, a raisin off the cake mm. when she did her walkthrough and Amazing. then kept it in glass, in a glass box. Okay, so we're back to the letter. This That was all me talking. Okay. Naturally, I demanded to see it and she brought it in for show and tell <laughs> a week later. The kids offered to take me to the Payne Road location, but I declined because, <sighs> you know, teenagers are, teenagers are already scary enough. <laughs> Another weird connection, the Payne family, that the road is named um, uh-huh. uh, Red Payne, was my great uncle. Whoa. Oh, the, of, of which she's saying the Payne family that the road is named after. Got it. Red Payne is her great uncle. That's a terrifying name. Best Susan. Then she, then she tells a whole big long ghost story that I can't get into now, but we will save it for a different mini so please do yeah there, i got a ton of letters of people from that same show who were like yeah that that's those are my family members too the yeah. store the bitter blood murders which i'll read it at, at a hometown at some point it's, or, i it's, think that happens when it's like the, the small town infant yeah that's what's that's what's so scary about picking murders for live shows is that you don't want something like at the dublin show when <laughs> someone goes that's my what did they say that's my cousin <laughs> you're like oh really no it. are you mad at me <laughs> they were so into they it. were great um <laughs> cool all right anything else i think that's well oh this was just an email from the um the this is actually awesome this is the minneapolis murderino group and it says dear mfm fam inspired by the yoga renos i hosted a social movement um a couple of social movement classes yesterday oh. at six degrees in minneapolis which i guess is a yoga studio oh. we raised five hundred dollars for end wow. the backlog we also showed that even when the world seems inextricably fucked we can still do things to support ourselves and others my fellow teachers wanted to in on the do-gooding so now i'm organizing a full series every second sunday of every month one of our teachers will host a free class <gasps> with donations going to a non-profit they care about <sighs> the next two are already scheduled with november donations going to benefit tubman a local group helping over twenty-five thousand victims of trauma each year Aye. from fleeing war-torn areas to experiencing sex trafficking and intimate partner violence and in december camp bovi a summer camp for city kids who live in poverty and otherwise wouldn't get the to experience Experience, the super fun of getting eaten alive by mosquitoes, trying to watch the campfire smell from your hair, and writing pitiful letters home, begging for parents to come pick them up. Jesus. You know, fun summer camp shit. SSDGM Letta. Oh my god, that's beautiful. So the yoga, uh, that's the coolest thing that people are really kind of yeah. building this in, that is just our, in our passing, I want to get into yoga thing. Right. Now suddenly people are like, we're going we're gonna to be doing some shit. It's a great way to like do something for yourself even if you if you don't feel you know people sometimes don't do things because they don't feel worth self-care sure it's like well i'm doing something for someone else it's it's a great way it's not about you yeah it's a good kickstarter so good job minneapolis murdering us thank you for, for taking that uh, and I would just like to say, yes, the yoga has fallen away, mm. but the swimming has taken over. Amazing. And I just ordered, um, based on someone's recommendation on Twitter, I just ordered a, a waterproof iPod that I can <gasps> listen to while I swim my lap. That's a thing? Uh-huh. You're cha- I'll swim now, too. <laughs> no, I won't. But I might. <laughs> you could try. I could try. It's really, here's what I'll say. Not drinking coffee and swimming is like the most relaxed and low key I've been in three fucking wow. years. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. I'll, I'll drink my canned wine to that. <laughs> <laughs> I also just, just on a personal note, slammed my elbow into the wall right before I left my house to come over here. <laughs> and it, I, it feels broken and like, <laughs> it feels like my entire arm is broken. Oh shit. You know, when you like hit, it's red. I was, wa- is it? Mm-hmm. I was walking full speed into the kitchen and just was oh. putting my purse over my shoulder at the same time and clonked into it just oh, right on red. the edge it's, it looks broken it's broken it looks like it's falling off ooh, I think ooh. It's, oh gangrene i say gangrene now i'm doing um the scarecrow from wizard of oz yeah movies. it's pretty fucking all right that's just a personal update no i love it i appreciate it it, fe- it feels like we haven't recorded one of these in so long i know i want to get it all out that's right that's exactly right that's Exactly right. And that's exactly right. 
With America's number one meal kit, HelloFresh, you'll get easy seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door. All you have to do is cook and enjoy. HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality. From step-by-step -step recipes to pre-measured ingredients, you'll have everything you need to get a wow-worthy dinner on the table in about 30 minutes. Say goodbye to endless grocery store trips and takeout. HelloFresh has you covered. There's something for everyone, from family recipes to calorie smart and vegetarian, and fun menu series like Hall of Fame and, and Kraft Burgers. HelloFresh has more five-star recipes than any other meal kit, so you'll know you're getting something incredible. HelloFresh is flexible, and it fits your lifestyle, easily change your delivery days, food preferences and skip a week whenever you need. Break out of your dinnerette and make deliciousness part of every week with HelloFresh. I love that even though HelloFresh is super easy and they make it really basic and like straightforward, you still feel like you're cooking this like incredible home cooked dinner and that makes me feel good about myself. And that instead of just ordering takeout, I'm actually making something and preparing something at home and that just, it feels good. So for $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash Murder80 and enter Murder80. It's like receiving eight meals for free only at HelloFresh.com slash Murder80, promo code Murder80. Go by. I'm first, Steven said, right? Okay. That's right. You ready? I think so. Should we do this? Let's do it. All right. Hey, uh, it's mid October. Oh, my sister's birthday is today. Happy birthday, hey. Lee. Happy birthday, Lee. Um, it's mid, it's mid October. Everyone's favorite time of year. Halloween. Everyone loves it. Yes or no? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> are you gonna? T are you about to tell me the plot of the movie of Halloween? <laughs> I am going to read you the original screenplay <laughs> of the movie Halloween. <laughs> Love nothing more. There's so much silence. I was just movie. like, uh, I didn't really prepare this week, so no, no. But I am Open gonna. On. I am gonna go in a weird direction, and I'm going to uh, describe and explain some instances and the instances of and the uh, urban legend <gasps> and the truthiness to it of <laughs> poison Halloween candy. Yes! This is great! <laughs> Yay! I'm glad you're here with me. <laughs> Listen, I would like to go ahead and thank almost exclusively <laughs> Snopes.com. Nice. One of my favorite time wasters back when I uh, had a desk job. Yeah. And our old friend Wikipedia best info right there that as a married couple Ugh. is all you need on the internet i mean you're the smartest person in the fucking room yes at your desk you could actually use snopes on wikipedia oh my god not a bad idea no i just thought of that from for myself <laughs> Sno for the snopesopedia <laughs> what if that's a new thing who will somebody invent this this new third thing and then give us a cut <laughs> yeah and then we'll just read from that no i'm not reading i'm kind of am. okay i'm not okay so <laughs> let's start with let's start with it all right so the stories of crazy people passing out poison candy or candy that has razor blades or needles in it mm. has been around for fucking decades as an urban legend. Um, it, and it makes sense because every, every 364 days of the year, we tell kids don't take candy from strangers. That's right. And then one day we're like, go get free candy from strangers. It's a can, the candy purge is That's really <laughs> where every, all the rules are gone. That's right. You could do what you want and you can stab people. It's very confusing for children. <laughs> it's so crazy. And you can stab people. What isn't fucking confusing for children? I mean, kids are pretty stupid. It's And everyone lies to them constantly. That's right. It's constant lying. That's exactly right. So, um, actually, I didn't know this. And Snopes told me, Ann Landers, you know, go ask Ann Landers. What was it called? <laughs> Dear Abby. <laughs> Dear Abby. Thank you. <laughs> they each, you know, it was two sisters. That's right. And they so, each I had was, so one was Dear Abby and one was Ann Landers, I think. Okay. I think they're two different because one's yes. a Dear Abby is Abigail Van Buren. Okay, then Anne is go ask Anne Landers, <laughs> you know, <laughs> her column. Uh, she published a column in 1995 that said, quote, in recent years, there have been reports of people with twisted minds putting razor blades and poison in taffy apples and Halloween candy, which is like, well, you're spreading that. Go and, ask Anne. And also, sorry, Anne, but taffy apples are from 1920. <laughs> so this is all bullshit. Okay, and according to Snopes, since 1959, there have been around 80 reports of sharp objects uh, in in food, and some hospitals and police departments they started to uh, offer to X-ray the the candy in children's uh, that they got before eating, which sounds like a blast for kids. And yes. actually, the, I first heard about that when Vince told me about it. Oh, really? That he, when he was a kid in Michigan, outside of Detroit, they'd get dressed up and go trick or treating, and then not get home and go through any dollar candy, then go 
go to the police station and have it fucking x rayed <laughs> <laughs> And I, w- I asked him for more details, and he's like, no, it just happened, like, every year. So that was standard in the, his town? I think it was standard in his town. He's like, it sucked that... It, it was also true that my, like, his family all worked in the police department, so I think that they, like, insisted upon it. Yeah. But yeah, it was standard. That's what kids did. That's amazing. I... Yeah. I, I always thought all of that was bullshit. I thought it yeah. was, that was just as much no. of a story as the bl- razor blades themselves. That part's true. I don't know if it's still happening, but I imagine there's got to be some towns. All I remember is my mom, now uh, now I know, being high <laughs> and stealing my fucking candy when I got home. The good shit. Yeah, that's right. Sorry, mom. She grabbed those Snickers. She's like, oh, you can have the sweet tart. She knows. Yeah, thanks, mom. I don't yeah. want the fucking Whoppers or whatever. Um, and But the majority of those reports turned out to be hoaxes. And even when the stories were true, it was usually a family member fucking with someone else in their family or a little kid being like, look, there's poison on it. But he had like dipped it in poison and <laughs> not eaten it and shown them and then just being a little shithead. Go to your room. <laughs> Forever. Forever, you little shit. Okay. So I'm going to tell you some stories of when it was true-ish, you know, kind of. Okay. And why, and maybe that helped help the rumors abound. Sure. Well, because you only really need one of those stories for people right. to freak out because it's like... It, it it's somebody once a year is going to try to kill your child with right. a hidden thing. And a lot of these are like something happened and it blew up in the media. And then when they found out what really happened, that didn't get covered as much. So in people's minds, it's true. Yeah. So let's start in 1964. The normal media cycle. Sh- right. Yeah. <laughs> so in 1964, uh, Helen Fleal, I don't know how to, P-F-E-I-L. Spell it like you say it. Yeah, that looks, I think flea, fleal, fleal is good. Fleal. Fleal. In Greenlaw, New York, she was a housewife, and she got caught handing out uh, packages of inedible, inedible treats uh, w- at, in what she described as a joke. She had become annoyed that a bunch of trick-or-treaters were showing up that were like teenagers and too old to be trick-or-treating. Yeah. And so she was pissed off at them, and so she was like, I'm going to make up these little packages to give out to the fucking the little bratty 16 year olds okay in the packages uh were dog biscuits steel wool pads <laughs> and arsenic laced ant poison buttons oh no so she'd like i don't know somehow do that she uh, was crazy she was crazy and kind of a bitch okay <laughs> right yeah you can't give people arsenic of any kind even e- if it's a joke even as a hilarious joke a jokey prank um, but they were clearly marked poison and labeled with the skull and crossbones so like yeah but you could have just written that somewhere and been right. like get it i'm trying to poison you and not actually do it yeah like what if one of the kids had eaten it you know teenagers they're really stupid carol would have been like oh well ha 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 yeah i'm so funny um so sh- she uh told the teenagers that the packages were a joke when she handed it out it sounds like she was just trying to be the cool aunt oh okay. and it got and, it, and then um Maybe she was a little high yeah all right no one uh was harmed at all but oh. even so the potential to harm was there so she was charged <gasps> by the police she pled guilty to endangering children and eventually received a suspended sentence wow dang helen. it oh no she really regretted that hilarious joke <laughs> jokes on you <laughs> helen helen i get it when you're always trying to be funny yeah it really fucks your life up <laughs> i get i get you in 1970 two days after halloween a five-year-old kid named kevin lapsed into a coma and died uh four days after uh four days later and it came out that he his family said that he had eaten some halloween candy that that was shown when they tested it had been sprinkled with heroin oh my god right it's so awful uh it was reported as a real life example of what happens on halloween but was what less likely was reported was that when police investigated further they found that the boy had gotten into his uncle's heroin stash Aww. consumed it and in a uh, in a attempt to cover for their for the uncle had sprinkled the candy themselves with heroin oh no i know that's just that's just tragic all, all it's around horrible but it's an you know in people's minds that's there was a connection there right it's awful in 1990, a seven-year-old Santa Monica girl named Ariel died on October 31st on Halloween while trick-or-treating. Like, while she was trick-or-treating, the police um, were f- feared of mass random poisoning, so they immediately c- um, conducted an intense door-to-door search of the- on the street where she had collapsed. They thought other kids might have gotten poison 
Halloween candy. So they blocked off the street. They took all the kids candy and questioned everyone for several hours and uh, interviewed residents and, and Halloween trick or treaters. What I mean, yeah, yeah, the only kind, the only kind of trick or treaters. <laughs> I, but in the end, it turned out that Ariel had actually died of congenital heart failure. It was just uh, a fucking huge coincidence. So it's well, here's the thing, though. That's insanely tragic. So I don't mind that it's like, guess what? Halloween's canceled. Yeah. Because it's, it's like, this is the worst thing that could happen. And no, you shouldn't just pretend like yeah. it didn't happen. Uh, it's awful. So it's n- just awful. 91. Uh, 1991, another suspected Halloween poisoning occurred in Washington, D.C. A 31-year-old named Kevin Michael Cherry of Montgomery County died shortly after eating some of his kids' Halloween candy. Oh, no. Um, Parents lost their shit, dumped all their kids' candy, and uh, but later it was determined that by an autopsy that he had died of um, congenital heart failure as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. But natural causes. Natural causes. yeah. Yeah. So, uh, then in 1996, seven year old, a seven year old named Ferdinand of San Jose, California collapsed on Halloween after eating candy and cookies he was given while trick or treating. Initial urinalysis. Urine analysis? Mm hmm. Is that urinalysis? I don't know. Uh, at the hospital showed traces of cocaine in his system. Oh, no. So everyone loses their shit, throw away all their candy, but then tests come back and it was negative to cocaine and it, the first results were wrong. So uh, n- the media had already picked it all up, but later they found out that um, he had died of natural causes as well. Oh, God. I know. Oh, it's just the worst yeah well and it makes sense that like the media also has this big story it's like sells papers and then it's the truth of it is just tragic it's just tragic and heartbreaking so they put it in a little column as a follow-up yeah that no one even pays attention to because also everyone's already got it doesn't make sense to just beg for free candy from strangers it's a weird tradition that we do so people are i i feel like at any bad news people are just like well let's just throw it all away yeah do you give out do you like stock your no one comes down our street because there's it's a more popular like four blocks over oh yeah and so everyone on our street goes totally dark people pretend everyone pretends they're not home Love it. and i've had one trick-or-treater it was the cutest it was a mm. little like a four-year-old girl and i think her a slightly older brother and i just gave each of them half the bowl of candy i love it i was just like you guys are the only ones <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, this is our favorite house <laughs> yeah. i want to live in a place one day that does trick-or-treating yeah like i just have never lived in a place that does that it's very you know what's the cutest well in my hometown petaluma yeah it's really big on d street which is the street with all the big old victorian houses <gasps> and people go crazy they make their houses haunted houses mm. they make like it's just total tradition yeah. and it's really fun someday i need to go hang out with my nephews on that day instead of just yeah not see what they're into right uh um, instead of going to all your parties my fun things and my live show actually i'm not coming to the live show i'm gonna go trick-or-treating with my nephews okay i'll bring nora down to co-host with me great <laughs> sounds great um she's like actually i'd rather trick-or-treat yeah nora's like i have plans over <laughs> on d street thanks anyway um in the year 2000 a dude named james joseph smith of minneapolis stuck needles in the snickers bars that he handed out this is the one we've all heard of uh-huh, to trick-or-treaters what year was it sorry this is 2000 i'm sure it's happened Stop. before that yeah um there were several children who bit into the candy bars but there was only one teenager who was pricked by one of the needles and he d- and it wasn't like bad but Good. if i'm pricked by a needle i'm like i'm dying take me to the hospital yes and also like a needle uh, in your mouth yeah. anywhere in your mouth is uh, very upsetting terrible um but police charged smith with one count of adulterating a substance with intent to cause harm or illness I mean, that's really throw the book at him. Yeah. (laughs) How about charging him with just being a fucking creep? A creepy dude and a dick. And an asshole. And and keep your children away from him. 30 to 60 years. Boom. For those charges. Did you know that? (laughs) Sounds harsh, but have you ever met a creepy (laughs) dick? Yeah, you'd want them to go away for 30 years too. Promise you. Minimum. 
Uh, and then in the town of Hercules, California, mm-hmm. that's near you-ish? Not really. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> in 2000, again, some trick-or-treaters, <laughs> so these trick-or-treaters come home and they're like, Mommy, Daddy, wh- why are these little Snickers, um, the individual miniature Snicker bars, like done up like little packets and there's some like, there's some weird oregano in them. So they find these little packets of uh of pot tied Weed, up, yep. tied up in these fucking <laughs> Snickers bars, like oh, like when they open the Snickers, it's pot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So that really did happen, and the police are like, "Wait, what the fuck?" The homeowners apparently weren't my mom because they were like bummed about it. <laughs> yeah. Um. Because they called somebody. What about if that it? was the whole time my mom was like, "I'll take this one, this one, and this one." It was just her dealer. Like, <laughs> that you had just been drug running for your mom. <laughs> In the 70s? Once 80s. a year, yeah. Mom, I don't think it's October 31st. Just go out with your <laughs> pillowcase. Go, go trick or treat down the street. <laughs> um, so so they they find the house where they had gotten the f- little baggies of pot and the homeowner was like, uh, wait, what the fuck? Like the homeowner legit didn't know what was going on and the police believed him. He's telling the truth. Turns out this dude worked in the dead letter office at the local post office and he had found a bag of miniature Snickers in the dead post post stuff. Oh, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he had found that with along some like canned food. And the post office was like, "Here, take this to the ch- local charity." But he was like, "Well, I'm just going to take these Snickers and pass them out at a." Uh, at Halloween, oh, but it dude. turned out that the candy was probably just someone's attempt at smuggling pot through the mail. <laughs> and what a great attempt it was. Great. Yeah. This guy should go to prison for being a stupid idiot <laughs> and stealing from the charity, too. I don't know. <laughs> you kind of love him. <laughs> I do, I Bumbling old. Do. His name's Herb. <laughs> Bumbling old Herb. He's just kind of like, he, he didn't. He knew he had to have candy for the trick or treaters, yeah. but he didn't want to spend that five bucks. And he's also not, he's giving it away. It's not like he's making money off of it. And he clearly didn't open, it. like, he's yeah. actually a miracle case, in my opinion. He didn't open and try to eat sure. any of them himself to then know. He could have made a lot of money weed. off of that and given that to charity. Dude, that's what you give the teenagers. Right. And show it to him first, make him give you some money. <laughs> Karen's got it planned. I've got it. Okay. Finally, we've gotten to the real fucking deal. Okay, here we go. Yes. Wait, can I just just say this? Mm -hmm. Because this is just reminding me, and I can't remember if I've told you, but one time when we were trick-or-treating on D Street, before it was like as commercial as it is now, Mm -hmm. back when it was just the real 80s deal, Sure, (laughs) we were with our friends and their babysitter, Uh so we were like eight or whatever, and then this was like a 15-year-old girl that was, was with eating us. eating all your candy. No, no, no. She was super chill. She would just like let us walk yeah. up and she would stand at the end of like the walkway yeah. and wait for us. And we walked up to this one house and it was the oldest lady and she had a little, gr- like mo- I still remember all of it, a moss green bowl and it had like eight little just cookies, Aww. like like powdered sugar cookies uh-huh. i couldn't tell if they were packaged or she'd made them but she was uh-huh. like here you go and we all were like thank you we're, of course uh-huh. we didn't want them but we we're like thanks so much and we <laughs> walk back kind of holding them like yeah. uncomfortably <laughs> and we get to the end of the thing and the 15 year old sees them all in our hand and she just <laughs> slaps each cookie out of each of our hands she was like put that down throw that away like that oh my god because they were like homemade yes and because they were covered in white powder oh my god she fucking like was like wipe your hands off do this and like had this thing what if she saved her life and what if she did but we were like that old lady it made me laugh for so long because i was like if you had seen this old lady she would be the last person you would think that would ever murder you with her lemon drop cookies but this girl was just like throw it away like (laughs) went into full (laughs) babysitter mode it was the best i'm just picturing the um grandma come out on the next morning and see her <laughs> cookies like laying waste on the sidewalk in front of her and her heartbreaking yeah and that's how she oh. died <laughs> so sad all right let's get to the real deal okay october 31st aka halloween <laughs> 1974 here we are yes. it, ronald mark o'brien this fucking dude takes his two kids timothy and elizabeth trick-or-treating in pasadena texas um with their neighbor dude and the neighbor's two children coming along with them what's up we're all going trick-or-treating fun 
Great. They stop at one of the places they stop. Nobody answers the door. And so everyone runs ahead except for fucking good old Ronald Mark O'Brien, who's like, I'm going to catch up with you guys. When he does catch up with them, he's like, oh, they someone answered the door finally. And he gave me these pixie sticks. Uh oh. So he gives uh, he produces five 21 inch pixie sticks and uh, he gives uh, two of the pixie. He gives one pixie stick to each of his kids and one each to the. Uh, uh, neighbor's kids and then they get home and he, they see uh, an, a 10 year old kid that they knew from church and Brian's like oh here's the last pixie stick to this guy so he passes out five pixie sticks oh. that he apparently got from this ghost okay. neighbor okay um, before bed that night there, his son eight year old Timothy asks to eat some of the candy he'd collected he chooses a pixie stick and which is I call bullshit because no fucking kid wants a pixie stick. No. He has trouble getting the candy open and the powder out, so his dad helps him with it. He says it tastes bitter, so um, he gives him Kool-Aid to wash away the taste. And Timothy immediately complains that his stomach hurt, and he goes to the bathroom. He begins vomiting and convulsing, and then he goes limp. Oh. I know. And little Timothy O'Brien dies on the way to the hospital less than an hour after consuming the candy. Shit. Of course, the community goes fucking ape shit. Parents in the area bring their kids candy to the police, thinking it was laced with poison. And initially, police didn't suspect uh, this dude, uh, Ronald, any with any wrongdoing until Timothy's autopsy reveals that the uh, pixie stick he consumes w- was laced with a fatal dose of potassium cyanide. Oh, my God. Um they go to find the other pixie sticks, the like four other ones, and fucking thank God none of the kids had eaten them. Oh, good. But when they go to the big kid's house, they couldn't find the pixie stick in his bag of candy. The parents are freaking out. Where's the pixie stick? They go upstairs to uh, the kid's room. He's sleeping on his bed and he's holding the pixie stick. He had tried to open it, but it had been uh, shut in such a way that he couldn't open he it. He couldn't get it open, so he just fucking fell asleep, probably because from he sugar. Was he was stoned. He was ten. He, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's a miracle yeah he was it was sitting with him that mother cried so hard oh then god. she slapped everyone around her can you would just you just be like them. damn it don't ever scare me like that don't again you ever pixie she's slapping the pixie stick back and forth across its face oh my god <laughs> Um, she rubs a little of it on her teeth just to make sure <laughs> let's see da, 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 da. uh Bah, 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 bah. Okay, so all five of the pixie sticks, uh, turns out they had all been tampered with. They had been opened, and the top two inches had been refilled with cyanide powder and then resealed with a staple, which is why this kid couldn't open the fucking thing. And like, uh, according to a pathologist who tested the pixie sticks, the candy consumed by Timothy contained enough cyanide to kill two adults, oh. while the other four cyanide, the other four candies contained dosages that would. Uh, killed three to four adults jesus christ yeah even stronger Mm -hmm. police investigated ronald and learned that he was over a hundred thousand dollars in debt and he had a history and this is 1974 money which we know is that's that's a million dollars in today's it's easily a million Mm -hmm. dollars and he had a history of being unable to hold down a job he was going to get fired soon his car was about to be repossessed he had defaulted on several bank loans and um the family home was about to be foreclosed on and of course he had also taken out uh, life insurance policies for a large sum of money on his children. Ugh. Despite his uh, insurers being like, why do you want to take out another $20,000 on your kids? It was like up to $60,000 that he was t- he had took- taken out on, I think, each of his kids. So he's just an awful psychopath. He's a fucking piece of shit. At his trial, he... Cont- he maintained his innocence throughout this whole thing, including at his trial, obviously. Um, his defense was mainly that hey man look at all these decades of urban legends uh, about mad poisoners on halloween it must have been some fucking crazy poisoner and look how much like legend or like how much history there is of that so you can't blame me it's a known thing that everyone does just like all the stuff i just read to you (laughs) uh and it didn't fucking work because it's not really true it's not true the case was circumstantial completely but still ronald o'brien was convicted of the murder of his son timothy in may 1975 he received a death sentence and was executed by lethal injection on march 31st it should have been fucking halloween uh 1984 shit Mm -hmm. and that is some stories of fucking candy 
being laced. Wow. On Halloween. So the one real one is like the worst creepiest. The one real one is like true as fuck, which is why it can keep being told. Because it's like, it's true, but it's not what you think it is. It's true, but then it's just, it's the lie of like, but this is what people do. Right. Which is like. No, but they don't. They kill their kids and their family for fucking life insurance money. That's what they do. That's what, that's the truth of it. Yeah. The husband did it. That's the real trick. (laughs) And it's not a treat. The trick of life (laughs) (laughs) is that life is no treat. (laughs) So this was one of the stories and i think i told you when we were in medford massachusetts Mm -hmm. it's from there but it is one of these stories and i remember the first time i saw this on um you know which nightline or whichever Mm -hmm. uh true crime kind of magazine show and it was one of the most shocking (gasps) true crime stories i'd ever seen on tv (gasps) and really a huge bummer and I figured for our live show, it would be such a bummer. Yeah, everyone's like, why didn't you do this one all the time? And it's like, because you can't tell an audience full of people the most huge bummer you've ever heard. Of your well, life. you can, but then it's just real quiet. Yeah. And it's a real bummer. And we don't get to have any fun. No. And so when we, that's why we like to do like more historical or the weirder yeah. ones. Um, because then there's, there's, you can have a little more fun. This yeah. is, this is one of the worst. Uh, and most fucked up crimes. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Um, and it's the murder of Carol Stewart. Okay. So all of the information that I got in these stories, I got from two articles. One was written for Boston Magazine by a guy named David J. Uh, Krychek, I believe is the way you pronounce his last name. Um, and the other is, uh, was written by Roberto Scalise for Boston.com. And they were, both of them are just full of information. And I'm, uh, you know, there's lots of pull quotes and big chunks of just their writing. Yeah. Um, such, they, they put it together really nicely and, and concisely. Um, so it's the night of October 23rd, 1989, and uh, 29-year-old Chuck Stewart and his 30-year-old wife, Carol, are driving home um, in their Toyota Cressida from a birthing mm-hmm. class at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Um, Carol's seven months pregnant with their first child. Uh, at 8.43... Uh, PM, the state police dispatcher Gary McLaughlin gets a phone call from Chuck Stewart's car phone and he says, my wife's been shot. I've been shot. (gasps) So, um, the dispatcher asks if Carol's breathing and Chuck says, I just hear gurgling. (gasps) And then basically for the next 13 minutes, this dispatcher tries to get Chuck to say where he is ah. in the city. And Chuck is saying, I can see a busy street ahead of me. I can't, I'm in so much pain. Uh, I'm, tr- I'm, and the guy's going, look at a street sign. Yeah. Look at this. We're trying to find you. And the guy's just screaming and going crazy. Did you listen to it? No, but they had it. <gasps> In, uh, I have a picture of one of the um, newspaper headlines, uh, like an article yeah, yeah, yeah. that was a front page article. And they have the, <gasps> the um, what do you call that? Transcript. The, the transcript of it as the beginning of the article. <gasps> and it's just the guy going, Chuck, look up for me. Tell me what street you're on. Like anything. Oh and it takes 13 minutes. Holy shit. Um, so, and the guy assumes this guy is in shock. So he yeah. sounds lucid. He's speaking in a lucid way, yeah. but he's, he's in shock and he's been shot in, in the gut basically. Okay. okay. Um, so when police finally do find them, the car is at the corner of St. Alf- St. Alphonse street and horrid and way, horrid and way. And they're, so they're just blocks from the, that hospital where they were taking their wow. birthing class. Um, now this is so so fucked up. So the paramedics get there, and they have a camera crew from the show ne- Rescue Nine One One. No, riding along with them. No, yes. So they all get out of the ambulance and um, start working on these guys in the car. And there's and basically there's footage of Jesus of it. Christ. Yeah. And uh, God, I watched the shit out of that show as a kid. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it actually. I, I don't I, know if it made it onto the real show, not, right? but the pictures, like there, there's pictures yeah. from that. So there is footage, there is footage. Yeah. I don't know where it ended up living that shows Carol pregnant with a gaping <gasps> head wound being cut from her seatbelt no! and laid onto a stretcher as the EMT is compressing her chest and trying to, um, get a heartbeat going. Oh my God. So, 
Um, they rush her back to bring him in women's hospital. The doctors, um, they have, they take the baby out. It's so it's only, it's under four pounds. Um, and they put the baby on life support. Oh my God. Um, Chuck is taken to Boston City Hospital. This isn't this area of Boston where there's it truly like hospitals everywhere. Yeah, and everyone's it's, going to school and shit and yeah. learning. And things. It's all kinds of colleges and all kinds of hospitals. Yeah. So Chuck goes to Boston City and he un- he then undergoes six hours of surgery on his bow- bowel, gallbladder and liver. And he has substantial damage, but uh, and it's and is in critical condition, but he survives. Unfortunately, Carol does not. Mm. Um, she's pronounced dead at 3 a.m. on October 24th, 1989. So for Four days later, on October 28th, Carol is buried in Medford, Massachusetts, which was the town oh we were, the, the area we were in. Yeah. Um, because that's where she was from. Oh, honey. More than 800 people, including Boston Mayor Ray Flynn, Governor Michael Dukakis, and Cardinal Bernard Law attend her funeral. Wow. Um, and Chuck is is still in the hospital, um, but he manages to write a eulogy for his wife's funeral, and it is read by a family friend Ugh. and this is what they read <gasps> good night sweet wife my love god has called you to his hands not to take you away from me or the happiness and gladness you brought to me but to bring you away from the cruelty and the violence that fills this world mm. he said that for us to truly believe we must know that his will was done and that there was some right in the meanest of acts in our souls we must forgive this sinner because he would too he capital A G. My life will be more empty without you, as will the lives of your family and friends. You have brought joy and kindness to every life you've touched, and now you sleep away from me. I will never again know the feeling of your hand in mine, but I will always feel you. I miss you, and I love you, your husband, Chuck. I want to cry and get really sad and emotional, but I'm scared he did it, so I feel not ready to cry about that. Yeah, I would stay in a neutral place Great. for now. That's what I... But I don't want to ruin it for you. Um, no, that's okay. I feel like... Just the pattern of these things yeah, has ruined it for it's us. It's ruined. All. I'm like, do I feel for him and cry or do? Okay. Here's, can I point out why I think your instincts are telling you, hey, dry those eyes. Okay. Because the line in our souls, we must forgive this sinner yeah. because he would too. Just, yeah. just a, something I italicized. I'd like to go ahead and allow Vince to have hate in his soul for whoever <laughs> kills me one day for the rest of his life. Right. And that's fine. Yeah. Because when we're so quick to forgive the right. sinner, like this is still the funeral. Yeah, let's get, let's get past this, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Let's give it a year. Okay. <laughs> okay. So two of Chuck's brothers act as pallbearers uh, carrying uh, Carol's casket during the services. Mm-hmm. And then on November 9th, 17, at 17 days old, their baby dies of respiratory failure. Oh. So it's two deaths. Oh. So then when, when the police talk to Charles Stewart, he tells them, get ready. Here I am. Boston, 1989. You got a car phone, bro. A black man with a raspy voice invaded their car that night. He said the man took cash, the car keys, jewelry, and Carol's Gucci bag. But before he left, he he started saying he thought that Chuck was 5-0. He thought he was a plain coast close cop, and then he shot both of them. Jesus. And Chuck said that on the first shot, he ducked, and that's why the first bullet hit him in the abdomen, and the second shot hit Carol in the head, killing her and ultimately the unborn baby. So when all of this hits the newspapers the next day, the city goes into mm-hmm. a complete furor. Mm-hmm. The Boston Herald runs a headline that says, quote, a terrible night with this huge picture where, and it's a really disturbing picture. Carol is slumped toward the driver's seat. Her hair's in her face. Her <sighs> mouth is open. There is blood on no. her shirt. Um, while Charles, who's in the driver's seat, is his shirt has blood. It's ripped open. He's grimacing and it looks like he's fighting to get out of the car. It's really Why would graphic because it's fucking front page yeah. story. It's headline news. And because this was the height of the crack epidemic in America. Right. So all b- black neighborhoods pretty much in like, er, you know, ur- major urban areas were just overrun with violence and crime because of the cra- uh, crack epidemic. Um and then on top of that, this rescue 911 footage and pictures like this really made it real. It mm-hmm. was just like 
you know, this random, random shooting, this random crime. And here it pregnant is. Pregnant woman. A it's pregnant like a woman. Cu- a couple leaving their birthing car or whatever. It's yeah. like. The ultimate in innocence. Right, right. And the ultimate in whiteness. These right. two people. And. Um, Here's why it's okay for your racism to exist. A hundred percent. It just underlines the story. So in David Kerchak's article, he says, quote, but with a black perpetrator and white victims, it fit comfortably into this nation's deep-rooted prejudices about race and crime in boston white paranoia was running high as the crack epidemic intensified violent crime in black neighborhoods like roxbury but it wasn't long before an ugly racist murmur underscored white boston's empathy for the stewards Mm -hmm. mayor ray flynn seemed to sanction that attitude when he pledged to quote get the animals responsible yeah in the fucking press within days there are calls by lawmakers to reinstate the death penalty jesus frank bellotti a former massachusetts attorney general who was running for governor told the press quote i'd pull the switch myself wow and along with those incendiary statements the press was comparing the stewart's to the kennedys with the boston herald running an article about their lives with the headline quote dreams of camelot oh she was, my god yeah so she was really beautiful um, the, and he, w- they were really successful. They lived in a really nice part of town. And this was that kind of thing where they symbolized like the up and coming white couple. Right. Um, so basically Charles Stewart Jr. and Carol, um, D. Miotti Stewart met in 1980. They were both working at a restaurant in Revia. Which is Chuck's hometown Revia I would not have I don't know how that's spelled But I would have not Probably said that I'm giving it the accent I'm giving it the Revere accent Mm. Because it's Revere Ah. But they say Revere Oh (laughs) (laughs) You know like Did you see the movie I love it Is it the boxer The fighter Yeah yeah. Christian Bale Mm, So good I think that took place Revere Revere Oh my okay. god So Carol is from Medford As I said mm-hmm. So is the Black Dahlia By the way Oh that's right And So she graduated From Boston College Then she went to Suffolk Law School mm-hmm. And graduated from there um, The two of them Got married in 1985 And she went on To a lucrative career As a tax attorney And Chuck Is uh, Becomes the manager Of a fur salon On Newberry Jesus. Street Jesus He makes Six figures A year being wow. the manager of a fur salon. I mean, people like their fur. It's I, pretty, I'm covered in it right now. And I didn't even have to pay anything for yeah, it. Yeah, seriously, if you look at my sweatpants, <laughs> it looks like I'm the manager of a fur salon as well. But mine's volunteer. Right. Um, okay, so they live in... Rivia. No, they don't live in Rivia. I want them to. They live in... It looks... It is spelled reading, but I bet it's reading Betcha. or some bullshit like that. Spell it like you say it. Um... The neighbors uh, were later quoted in the paper to say that they remembered the couple, quote, lingering over a goodbye kiss each workday morning. Oh, she'd had no idea. She married a monster. This kind of is reminding me of the, uh, what's the Bay Area one recently? Scott Peterson. Scott Peterson. Yeah. Lacey Peterson. Exactly. Because they're both pregnant. Yeah. Um, Okay. So, uh, Chuck's car keys... Uh, they turn up in a mission in the Miss- Mission Hill projects uh, in Roxbury. Weird. And so police add a hundred extra officers to go start kicking in doors and randomly frisking young black men looking for the quote black man with the raspy voice and the black sweatsuit with a red stripe. Yeah, um, you can't do that. Yeah, they do. And city councilor uh, David Scondras was quoted as saying, quote, you can't help but wonder if what you're watching is a class situation, that it's all right for the poor uh, to put up with an enormous amount of shootings and killings. But presumably, if you're white, upper income and suburban, maybe that changes things. That's sad. And Leslie Harris, a public defender familiar with the case, is quoted in the Boston Globe as saying, quote, the police kept telling the kids that they'd have to come to take a ride with them. The way they intimidated these kids into making statements, some heads should roll. Shit. And they really did do that, too, because two weeks after the shooting, a 15-year-old boy ends up telling police that his uncle, Willie Bennett, had bragged that he was the killer. Mm. The boy immediately recanted, but the police didn't care because they already had the name. And they... 39-year-old Willie Bennett was also the perfect suspect. He had spent most of his adult life in jail, and he had a long rap sheet. Um, 
with instances of violent crime, including he once threatened a cop with a shotgun in 1981. So it was, it was open and shut right mm-hmm. there. On November 11th, the Boston Herald gets the scoop and they print that Willie Bennett is a prime sp- suspect. And then a Norfolk prosecutor named Louis Sabadini calls Bennett a mad dog running amok mm. in the press. Mm. On December 28th, Chuck Stewart picks Bennett out of a police lineup. And um, when he did, <gasps> they say that he had a strong physical reaction when he saw Willie Bennett Shut in up. the lineup. Yeah. So it looks like everyone's like, we have our man and this case is solved until mm-hmm. the twist. Mm-hmm. On January 3rd, 1990, Chuck Stewart's 23-year-old brother, Matthew, contacts the DA (gasps) and asks for a meeting. (gasps) And in that meeting, he confesses to a shocking secret. (gasps) Turns out the murderer was not a black man in a black sweatsuit with a raspy voice. Carol Stewart and her unborn child had been shot in cold blood by none other than the grieving husband himself, Chuck fucking Stewart. Dude, this 23-year-old brother comes forward and is like... And listen to this shit. Oh, my God. Tell me everything. He says that his brother asked him to drive by the scene and take the purse that had the gun and the jewelry in it and then go drive the uh, drive and throw um, the that purse with all that evidence in it um, off the dizzy bridge and into the Pines River. And his brother paid him ten thousand dollars to do that. And so basically, um, and he said he didn't know that Chuck was going to shoot Carol. He just had agreed to come by and do this thing for $10,000. So had she already been shot when he did it? Yeah, he must have because he was getting rid of the gun. Right. But Matthew said he didn't know that that was the plan. He was just there and then was given this bag. Holy but shit. But once he was there, he yeah. knew what happened. And he kept doing it. Was- yeah. So, um, but he basically, he, so... Oh, God, is there a video of, of his in- interrogation or confession? Oh, I don't know. I want to watch But that. there's pictures of him in the paper. Uh-huh. So, basically, he then kind of talked to the press after this. But Did he, he carry her fucking casket? Yeah, that's the next thing I was going to read. Oh, okay, sorry. Is that, no, no, no. Him and his brother, who he confessed to two days later... Um, the, their older brother, Michael, he went and he told him that this was actually a murder. And then they went and carried her casket at her funeral, knowing the truth. Oh, I want to see photos of them carrying the caskets. Yeah, there's, you can find all of this. I mean, that's the craziest thing about this entire crime is it was so meticulously and insanely covered in the, in the paper that like every moment of this crime is in the paper. And Matthew says that he finally came forward when he realized Charles had fingered Willie Bennett for the crime (gasps) and that that he knew an innocent man was going to go to jail for the murder that his brother had committed. Wow. Um, And a year later, Matthew Stewart was found guilty of obstruction of justice and insurance fraud. So he did time for this, for being a part of basically aiding and abetting. Okay, so now... The fucking DA and the authorities know that it's actually Chuck Stewart. It's the, it's like the hardest 180. Yeah. That all of those people who are like hell bent on the storyline yeah. that, that they have to fucking give it up. They have to turn it around. So there's a citywide manhunt for Chuck Stewart. And it turns out that he had checked in at the Sheridan and Braintree in room 231. And on the night of January 3rd, he, he calls down to the front desks and asks for a 4.30 a.m. wake-up call. Oh, no. And a ch- sunrise on January 4th, 1990, commuters report an unoccupied Nissan Maxima is stopped on the lower deck of the Tobin Bridge. It's Chuck Stewart's new car that he had bought with the insurance, the life insurance payout of Carol's life insurance. Um, authorities find a note on the front seat that Stewart wrote that said, quote, my life has been nothing but a battle for the last four months. Oh, you poor fucking baby. Uh huh. Whatever this new accusation is, it has beaten me. Uh-huh. I've been sapped of my strength. So he doesn't cop to it. Yeah. He doesn't admit it. He acts like he's been pushed to this yeah. because of this accusation. Yeah. Where his brother told the truth. Um, then Chuck Stewart jumped to his death from the Tobin Bridge into the Mystic River. Did he fake it? He really did it. People saw him. They pulled the body out. 
they pulled did they pull a body out that was my they next pulled question his, they pulled his Holy body out of the river shit. how have i i yell this so often how have i never heard of this i know isn't it crazy i remember seeing this story when i was like in my early 20s and the turn the way they set up that turn was so perfect because they make you get racist they make you go get him yes and you see like willie bennett was brought into they had him in um in court for the charges and he's sitting there like in his you know jail Mm -hmm. clothes and he's kind of got his hand on his head and it is like it and but of course when you look at that through the eyes of someone right. before all of this information right. it's like there's the monster that killed those poor people well stories like this make you have make you check and reevaluate what you believe the media tells you and yes. what in the biases you have once you see that everything is a story that's portrayed a certain way yes that you know might not even be close to the truth yeah and it's the implicit bias thing where as a white person you're reading the news in a way where you don't have you know you don't have automatic empathy for people of color or somebody that's different from you that might be seeing this from a totally different or the minute you hear that they were on crack or that the minute you hear that they were a sex worker or or that they lived in the projects right and they don't deserve as much empathy as you do or they deserve things that happened to them when really these are all things that have been thrown at us too including the quote crack epidemic which you look into it it was a systematic way to make black people, le- you know, less powerful to it, it, addict it, them to drugs, ma- send them to jail. Exactly. All it it yes. was. It, I mean, fucking look it up, man. I know. Oh, I mean, and here's the thing too. You know, these are stories. These kinds of stories, I think we avoid a lot of the time because it's gross injustice yeah. it's gross racism we don't want to fuck it up yeah we don't want to tell the story wrong we don't yeah. want to get the information wrong or whatever yeah. but i think the way everything is happening in this country right now it's part of that thing of people just dropping the fucking storyline that you're holding on to that you're innocent right. or you didn't do anything or you're, you're not safe racist. because you live in a good neighborhood and you don't live in you know the or somehow you're immune to things because uh you know but that basically that you should be immune to it that, yeah. that that these kind of crimes that kind of crime is okay yeah if it's happening in that bad quote-unquote right. bad part of town it's not your problem if it's right. happening over there but if it comes into your part of town then then you know it, every everyone should go crazy right so it's it's obviously a huge huge issue in the justice system in this country it's a huge issue when you talk about p- it happening for pe- black people for happening for native americans mm-hmm. uh, i mean it's for sex workers all of it it's just that everyone you're treated differently if you're different than the status quo and if you're marginalized and you're not in power yeah. and you don't have fucking money as and we, we need all to, know we need to look into why we're why those things are happening and why people don't have money and why people are addicted to crack and have to sell crack and have to go into sex work or are want to go into sex work of course but and also kind of more immediately we have to stop privatized prisons. Yeah. That people make money for arresting pe- right. disenfranchised people who have no support, no money, and no representation. Yeah. And then those people are lost in the system and people make money off of it. Right. That should not happen. It's the same thing of why one one person of color will go to prison for selling a certain amount of, a small amount of weed and another fucking white person will talk about the soaps and lotions that they sell that and, and their weed brownie parties yes. and shit and it's fine and it's, it's all fine it's not okay it's not okay and i think these days that's all coming to the surface people's voices are being raised who need to be heard and need to be listened to where we're all learning about this as like suburban white gals uh of a certain age we we are now coming to understanding mm-hmm. about this in a way that we just didn't know before, mm-hmm. didn't ever understand, didn't have to have empathy mm-hmm. for before because it simply wasn't in our lives. Right. Um, okay. So all so seventy three days after the shooting, all of this news breaks. Everybody he immediately is cold. Does he immediately like how quickly from when they find out to when he jumps off the bridge? It's like a day. Okay. And the Boston Globe has a headline that reads, from nightmare to reality, a city is reeling. So it's continuing to play out in the press. And Mayor Flynn calls the case, quote, a giant fraud on this city. The police and the press 
um, and the authorities all blame each other. Mm-hmm. And lots of people claim after the fact that they were skeptical skeptical mm-hmm. of Chuck Stewart all along. But of course, Bullshit. there's very little evidence of that, especially since all of it was in the press. Yeah. Every moment of it, yeah. you had your chance to be skeptical. And none of those people were skeptical. Sure. In the least, they not only were skeptical, he was fucking John F. Kennedy. Yeah, right. Um, the New York Times wrote on January 6, 1990, quote, a vicious round of finger pointing began here today as prosecutors, the police and the news media began tracing the trail of faulty assumptions, disregarded suspicions, blunders and perhaps even lies that put the wrong man at the center of one of the most highly publicized and emotionally charged murder cases in this city's history. Jesus. End quote. Um, Mayor Flynn went to the Bennett home to apologize to Willie Bennett and his family, telling Mrs. Bennett that, quote, what has taken place has been very unfortunate. Unquote. I don't know if anything to do with fortune. Mm, fortunate yeah. or not. Not at all. The Bennett family later said that Mayor Flynn only stayed a couple of minutes and wouldn't sit down when offered a seat. Mm. Huh. Thanks for the fucking extension of yourself. Uh, soon news of Charles Stewart's activities in the weeks before and after the murder comes spilling out of the shadows. Mm-hmm. Just days before he jumped to his death, He was in Peabody buying jewelry for his secret younger girlfriend. Come on. There's also a story that he was angry that having a baby would cut Carol's paycheck. uh, What? From the family coffers. So Charles Stewart murdered his wife and baby and took $82,000 for all of that trouble, had full surgery, and then ends up three months later, killing himself. And then in September 2011, Matthew Stewart, his younger brother, died from a drug overdose in a Cambridge homeless shelter. Jesus. So obviously, his life was entirely destroyed yeah. by the entire thing. Um, I'll finish with this full quote from David J. Cryjack's uh, article. I'm sorry, I know I'm pronouncing that wrong. Quote, whatever its genesis, the crime picked from open Boston um, the crime picked open Boston's racial scab 13 years after the busing riots and Stanley Foreman's famous photo of a white teenager using old glory as a lance against Ted Landsmark a black man when Stewart's deceptions were exposed the globe called him quote a world class con man but he really wasn't prisons are full of spouse killers after all but boston's police and the public enabled stewart with their eagerness to accept his story michael curry president of the boston NAACP, is not sure that the case would play out any differently today quote it still has relevance we still live every day with the preconceived notions of black and brown boys as quote potential criminals stewart played on those prejudices he said to himself if i had to accuse somebody of a crime who would i accuse and where would it be a black man in roxbury dorchester mattapan he knew everyone would believe him and you know what he was right jesus and that's the story of the murder of Carol Stewart. Holy fucking shit. Isn't that fucked? Oh my god, dude. I mean, Willie Bennett was a dead man. He was gone. Like that yeah. he was going to go to prison for the rest. He was going to be killed in right. prison. Right. They wanted to reinstate the death penalty. Right. So fucked up. I feel yeah, it's so fucked up. The brother is also a tragic fucking character in it. I mean, because he did the right thing. That's I'm the surprised thing. he didn't get immunity for testifying against his brother, but it wouldn't have mattered. It would have been off the table at that. I mean, maybe there was going to, but because there wasn't a trial, they needed to give someone right get someone yeah and be- yeah you know those cops were like get somebody. Somebody has yeah. to do something to somebody. Immunity probably became off the table once he. And I bet you he didn't, they didn't seem like, maybe his brother had money, but they, like in the pictures where he's pointing to things and stuff, it's not like they seem like this rich family. If he didn't have a good lawyer, that wasn't going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And and you can't reward a person for aiding and abetting a crime. I I mean, mean, I I totally get that. And I, but still, yeah. Holy shit balls. That was fucked up. It's pretty fucked. Great job telling it. I mean, was, as I was reading it, I, I went back and forth and back and forth because it's like, I don't, I don't want to continually ignore those stories that seem to be like they, they, 
they seem to be pro- problematic in and of themselves. Yeah. But they do need to get talked about. Yeah. And, and there are the stories that like, I think we try to do the outer edges of these are the crazy, yeah. these are the crazy crime stories, but these are actually just the tragic standard, uh, you know, yeah. injustice based type of stories. Yeah. And if you want to, I feel like the, the crime epidemic, I mean, the crack epidemic thing is like, Look in the way, look at the way this, uh, opioid epidemic is being handled, which is mainly white people th- versus the way the crack epidemic was handled. Yes. And you'll see how big of a difference you're, you're treated depending on your race. That's because right. Because pe- people are going to prison for dealing opioids. People are getting, you know, rehab and being tr- constantly treated with kid gloves for the opioid crisis, which is awful. I completely agree, but. Yeah, there was never an article in, like, the New York Times about how do we help these people with the crack em- epidemic. Right. It was the Just perfect Just send them to tool. prison and look at these crack-addicted people. It's the de- a perfect dehumanizing tool. Right. And everybody fell. F- most most people, white people, fell for it. Right. Or just bought bought that storyline. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, well, great job. Thank you. <laughs> Should we do a fucking hooray? Uh, yeah, that's the time. <laughs> I know mine. Okay. Um... Uh, I just keep touching my elbow. Oh, my, my broken elbow. <laughs> my broken elbow. It's fucking... The new season of Shit's Creek has come out. Your baby. My baby. I watched it. I accidentally woke up at 5.30, which I do sometimes. Oh, God. And then I remembered that it had come out, and I watched it. I think I watched all of it, at least, like, almost all of it before work, and then I came home and finished it. And it's just as beautiful and hilarious and great as it was last time even more so and it's just if you haven't gotten into Shit's Creek it's a little diamond waiting for you I'm excited to watch it on Netflix I love that it's waiting there for me oh and I got a sweatshirt do you have you watched it no okay what they does just, it say? There's a, there's a family store that they open. Oh, and you got a sweatshirt and of it's it? It's called Rose's po- Apothecary, and I got sent a sweatshirt oh of it. Oh, my God. And I was so excited. Have you worn it? I want people to, rec- like, to call it out. No, it ha- because it just turned cold, like, yesterday. Oh, yeah. That's true. It's cold <laughs> by, like, 72. It's yeah, exactly. Um, a light see. wind kicked up yesterday. I had... A, so, my uh, fucking hooray, I woke up the other day late in late in the morning like i do and i had this and i did the whole like god you gotta wake up earlier and get more shit done and i had this epiphany of um that i at like one out of ten effort i'm i consistently work at like a six a good six and considering my life it's gone pretty well but i would think i but my new thing is that i want to just put one extra point of effort into my life (laughs) (laughs) and that made it kind of all seem doable yeah in this like all you have to do is walk for half like what is what is the one point of effort more than what you're doing right now yes don't start drinking at five start drinking at eight you know (laughs) like or take tonight off or yeah go for a walk is that one point of extra effort don't flake today on this thing it's like that's good so I'm doing that and I'm I'm thinking that that might help some people too because I'm always like you have to be a 10 if you're not a 10 you're not fucking good enough that's the that's the trick of perfectionism right is if you're not perfect fuck it right which is the which is deadly yeah it, you know it's so funny it's very true because since I started swimming um, and it was very difficult for me yeah, to not be able to brag about you swimming. swimming is is an extra two points. You get another. And once you do that, right. you fold in this effort. Then all the the rest of the day, like the hardest thing about yeah. writing in a room is that there's literally a table yes. filled with all the good stuff from Trader Joe's Ugh. that just sits behind me all day. Like what? Tell me like what? Oh, the well, there's every type of chip. Like w- we have, there's just like ah, a chip station. Flight. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> flight. <laughs> oh, I, I'm glad I, I'm so glad I'm not a TV writer. <laughs> it's because you yeah. sit there thinking and while you're thinking, you, you think you can't think eat. of anything. So you eat chips. Totally. Or like, there's just like a big, the sh- that new quote, shareable bag of M&Ms. There's all kinds of things. My thing is I did my, I already did yeah. my thing. It makes me feel really good. Now I'm just going to like, I drink some tea and try right. to not graze. That's great. Yeah. Because you don't want to, you don't want to, um, what's the word? Like de- sabotage. Yes. Do you know what desabotage? Desabotage my swimming effort. So that's, yeah. So I, I look at it and it's like, I don't ever have to be a 10. Me as a six or seven has done pretty fucking good in her life. That's and right. I have a good and happy life. If I give it half or one point of effort more, 
Well, how great would that be? Exactly. So I'm going to do that. That's great. I don't know what to call it yet. But one point more? One point more. <laughs> one point extra extra effort. One point of extra effort. <laughs> it's re- it falls off the tongue. <laughs> it, just, it just falls face first off the tongue. It's perfect. Um, so I think that's great. That's also, because, you know, the, I believe the Japanese have a thing called Kaizen, and that's just small improvements daily Mm -hmm. and it's essentially like you'd like it's exactly what you're saying which is you don't have to be the perfect consummate housewife just do the dishes like real time yeah yeah yeah. that's my thing my dad all growing up my dad would always go clean as you go Mm -hmm. clean as you go and Mm -hmm. i never do it i just let things pile up yeah and lately i've been cleaning as i go yeah let's do that with our lives let's clean our lives as we go let's clean as we go it (laughs) feels better also New season of Someone Knows Something is really good. Uh, also, if you're sick of listening about murder all the time, but you still love true crime, and which I'm listening with Vince now because he doesn't like murder. Right. But he, we are listening to Last Scene podcast, which Last. I also found in Boston. Scene, S-C-E-N. Last Scene, S-E-E-N. Like the oh, last okay. time I saw something. Last Got Scene it. is uh, a podcast from the Boston Globe about the 28-year unsolved art heist of Boston's Illabella Stewart Gardner Museum. Yes. It's fucking good, and it's true crime, but it's not murder, which is great. I think I looked that story up. That's how I found it. When we're in a town, we're like, what murder can I... So you look up all these crimes, yes. and I found Last Scene, and I'm like... That one's great. Was that good. the one where they were dressed like cops? They, they broke into a museum. They're dressed like cops. There's some great <laughs> characters in it. I fucking <laughs> highly recommend this podcast. That sounds really good. And of course, Someone Knows Something, which is immediately making me cry uh, already. Hosted by uh, hot Canadian lumberjack with all the empathy, David Ridgen. <laughs> with the great, with just a great voice. Great, great cadence. You and just, you just want to be there with him while he discovers things. Yeah, he's great. Uh, new season. I love it. Oh, this is not a, we're not getting paid even. No. David, you owe us money. David, we fully support you. <laughs> and also, can I just say this? Yeah. This is from, this is le- left over long ago. But in the, at the London show that we did in May, um, so long ago now, oh my God. Um, I did Jack the Ripper and had kind of an emotional meltdown <laughs> while I had it. <laughs> Didn't really realize what a bad idea that would no, be. No, it was great. Um, it was fine, but it was one of those bad, it was just a bad feeling area. And then it was, but it was a great show. And we met great people at that meet and greet was epic. Mm-hmm. Every yeah. person we met at the London meet and greet was a one more fascinating character. That's where the Italians were. Oh, yeah. And um, all kinds of people. Yeah. Anyway, a woman, and I'm sorry I don't have your name. You recommended the book to me. They all love Jack and it is the best. I've been listening to it on audiobook <gasps> since she recommended it because it is so dense and it's the guy. Um, oh, look it up. Can you look it up, Stephen? Sorry. <laughs> they don't, they all love Jack. It's the Jack the Ripper. Oh, and it's written by the guy who, um, wrote the movie with Nail and I. That brilliant movie. It's a, it's an eighties like cult movie okay. and it is one of my favorite movies of all time. Okay. It's, it's about two actors that are totally on drugs that try to leave London oh and just God. get out into the country for the weekend. Yeah. And it's beyond hilarious. So uh, Bruce Robinson, Bruce Robinson is the writer of the movie with Nail and I, and he has written this scathing expose about ripperology and the bullshit <gasps> that has been put out and what the truth of like Simple who Jack truth. the Ripper was. And I've been listening to it on and off because it's so dense and the writing is so good. Like he, he quotes somebody and he says like, it's somebody, he's somebody that's telling a lie and covering something up. And so he does the thing and he writes blah, blah, blah. Um, and say the guy's name is Dan Smith. And he goes, blah, 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 Dan Smith shit mouth. <laughs> like it's writing like that where I, yes. keep, I keep going back and re-listening to whole chunks because the writing is unbelievably You're like, are great. You just, are we just having a conversation right yeah. now over pints? Because he's being, he is such a bitch about like how basically over the years, Ripperology yeah. has been taken the lies that have been put out and just gone, yes, and yes, dramatic yes. And and just adding on and adding on bullshit. Like Meanwhile, Halloween fucking candy poisoning. It's a total Halloween candy poisoning situation. Meanwhile, Bruce Robinson goes in and does the research and is like, it's blatantly obvious I love it. what the situation is. I highly recommend it. What's it called it. again? They All Love Jack okay. by Bruce Robinson. 
I recommend you do it on audio because yes. the guy that reads the audiobook is so talented and does goes in and out in and out of voices. It's great. And anyway, thank you to the person. Please email if you are the person who recommended that book to me so I can say your name because it was it was such a great recommendation, but it's the kind of thing that like a year later, I'm like, I finally read it. I finally did <laughs> listen to it. We get a lot of rec really good recommendations and gifts. Yeah. And every and life. Yes. Best life. Um, tweet at us what your, uh, what your one point extra would be. Oh, nice. Maybe. Right. Like my one point extra is that I will do the dishes as they come. Sure. That kind of, no, that's not mine. Uh, the example is example a clean as you go yeah. or a well, yeah whatever, whatever. Um, drinking more hot tea remember tea is a medicine yeah and add some vodka if you're me <laughs> Jesus I sound like an alcoholic this episode <laughs> I'm really not okay. also if you're gonna add anything to a hot drink don't let it be <laughs> vodka I don't know why you keep saying that rum rum, rum. rum. and maybe co Malibu coconut rum we're not also not getting paid by them <laughs> We should be. Hey, thanks for listening. Thanks to Stephen for editing a, so much shit out. You guys don't oh. even fucking understand how much shit he Stephen's doing out. his work tonight. And then th finding names that we can't remember. All the stuff. I mean, we always need you to do that, Stephen. Yeah. That's kind of standard. Yeah. I now don't even attempt to look things up. I'm just like, eh, just kind of look over my shoulder. Yeah, he's already got his phone up. Stephen! Uh, um, thanks for listening. You guys are the fucking best. You guys... Really, so many great things are happening in our lives. We get we say this all the time to, at the live shows, but yeah, we mean it to you guys too at home who don't go to live shows and maybe aren't even interested. <laughs> we really feel very, very grateful for all the things that we have because of the way that this show exploded. Mm -hmm. It's super nuts. Our lives are nuts because of it. Yeah, but in the best possible way. And yeah, we're just very grateful. So and thank you. We're grateful that you guys have found each other and started this community, and we just get to be uh, peripherally part of it and enjoy it and and hear stories about it. Hear stories and see you guys make connections and raise money for good causes and you know find yourselves and go to therapy and get tattoos, get and cool tattoos, and party and get and have art that gets made and we're just lucky to be part of it we really very appreciate cool. it and it's very cool to be part of the podcast the wave of the future which is podcasting everyone knows it everyone knows it get on board listen stay sexy and don't get murdered goodbye, goodbye. elvis you want a cookie ah.